Okay. Okay. Do I there you go. To, do I need to end the recording at the end? He he will have to do that. Oh, okay. Great. All right. <laughs> wonderful. Huh. Okay. So to begin our presentation, I have things I'm supposed to say. So <laughs> welcome to our presentation. It is entitled The School Across the Street. Your presenters are Abigail Barth, Tyna Fox, and Amy Dixon. Today is November 4th, 2021. I was gonna say 2011. It's November 4th, 2021, and this is session B11. All right, so I'm going to share here. Title has disappeared. All right, well, <laughs> this is our presentation, The School Across the Street. Um, and we are going to begin our presentation with a smudge and uh, a prayer and land acknowledgement from Elder Tina Fox. I'm lighting a sage smudge. And I will say the prayer in my language, the Ithaca language. Would you like to share about Amen? Oh, yes. <laughs> I was presenting it, uh, I was saying a prayer at, after a speech at the University of Calgary. And uh, I ended my prayer with the word Amen. Usually, in my language, it's a chat, which is so be it. So I ended my prayer in uh, as Amen. And this guy walks up to me and he says, I heard you say Amen in your prayer. And I said, Yes. That's for you guys who don't speak my language uh, to know that your prayer has ended. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you, Elder Tina. And yes. we'll let this go until. Yeah. It, okay. Yeah. Right. All right. Okay, so we uh, want to welcome you here for joining us at the foot of the Rocky Mountains. Yes. <laughs> Being our techie. Um, in Alberta, Canada, from Stony Nakoda First Nation. Did you want to mention uh, Minisni? Oh, Minisni, yeah. Minisni in our language means cold water. And uh, First Nations uh, across the country are starting to uh, use their traditional names for the places where they are at. And we are in that process, too. Our, place, our, our location is called Morley after some other Snow White person, I guess. But now it's Minisni. We've always called it Minisni, so that's where it is. Mm. Yes, and we are in Nakoda Elementary School right now. And we did want to let you know that if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, you're welcome to put them in the chat. Unfortunately, we can't see you while we're going. Um, but since there are so few of us, another mm -hmm. option is you are just welcome to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, and then we do have a discussion question in the middle of the presentation, and then at the end, of course, we can uh, come back here and just have a talk. Um, did you move your chair? No? no? Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do just a quick introduction. Uh, Tina, do you want to just start? Yes. <clears throat> I am, my full name is Valentina Fox. Um, I am a counselor and resident elder at Nakota Elementary School. I have a degree in First Nations and Aboriginal Counseling from uh, Brandon University in Manitoba. And I was the first woman in this community to be elected to our tribal council back in 1976. Uh, I have worked, I graduated in 2003 
from BU and I have worked with uh, SEA since. I am a mother, a grandmother, and a great grandmother of four, four children. Three boys and a girl. <laughs> awesome. Um, <clears throat> my name is Amy Dixon. Super honored as always to have China um, a part of our school and our community. I am, um, I'm actually uh, part of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Confederacy. I am uh, Tainaki and I am Nakota Sioux from here in Minithni. I was actually born and raised here. So this is where I say that I'm from. Um, I'm very proud to represent my people and I'm actually very humbled to be the first community member principal um, in Morley, in Minithni. Um, and I've been here since 2015. So as soon as I graduated, I returned back to the community. So I'm Abigail. Uh, I'm actually originally from Florida, but I moved to Canada to do my master's in social work at the University of Calgary. And most of my focus has been around trauma. My primary modalities as a therapist are expressive arts therapy and narrative therapy. And I have um, been here since February 2017, so almost five years. And so when we were discussing whether or how we were going to present this, what we realized is that each of us, and probably each of you, have a story of your first day of school that is memorable for some reason. And so that's how we structured our presentation, is to each tell a story of our first day of school. And I am going to start. So my story is called Office Politics. And uh, so I, I'm going to start the story for you. So imagine this. You're a young, newly graduated social worker. You've just accepted the position as a therapist for children in an Indigenous community, and you're told that as part of your new role, you're going to be working closely with the school elder, which is super exciting. And you want to make a good impression, so you rush order tobacco to present to her when you meet, and you rehearse what you're going to say, and what's the worst that could happen? Well, I'm going to tell you. On my first day at Nakota Elementary School, after being taken on a tour, I finally got to meet Elder Tyna, but instead of getting to offer her the tobacco and start off on the right foot as I had meticulously planned, she informs me that the higher ups at the time want to take away her office and give it to me. And this was not how I thought our first meeting was going to go. Here I was, I'm faced with an ethical dilemma and it's not even nine o'clock in the morning. So what do I do? Well, the fact that I'm sitting with my co-presenters today probably gives you an idea. That day I told Elder Tina that I wouldn't be taking her office and then I told those in charge the same. I told them that I would happily be anywhere, anywhere except for Elder Tina's office because how was I supposed to do good work if one of the most important opportunities for relationship building in this new role was destroyed before it could even start? So they found a space for me and Tyna kept her office. Mm -hmm. But more important than the office, at least for me, was the fact that our relationship was able to grow in spite of, or possibly even because of this initial complication. Through this experience, we both saw something in the other person that we liked. And now after almost five years, I'm honored to refer to Elder Tyna as a colleague and a mentor and a friend and a grandmother and a great grandmother. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but why is it that we tell this story? Well, there are some obvious reasons, like how this was a moment to stand for what is right, or the fact that had I made a different choice, our relationship would be different. But there's another reason we share this, and that has to do with whiteness and the power it can hold when working in community. Now, there can be a reluctance on the part of white educators to talk directly about race or acknowledge that colonization is present and an ongoing force. But in a school like this, where the majority of teachers are white, this acknowledgement is particularly important. So white teachers come to the community with preconceived notions, hidden biases and blind spots and unrecognized privilege. They often have good intentions, but may be unprepared to face the reality of poverty and intergenerational trauma. Conversely, some teachers can become so overwhelmed by the struggles of the community that they miss their children's, the students' resilience and strengths and joy. 
So for the past two and a half years, we've been having conversations about the kind of school community and culture that we want to build. And what has come from this is the desire to mold the school and the staff to fit the students instead of the other way around. One of the ways that we've been working towards this is by addressing issues such as race and privilege, giving practical guidance on working with community, and reframing more historically negative terms such as resistance or defiance and give power back to students and families. Now, this would be important in any context, but especially in a school and especially in Canada and especially in an Indigenous community. Because one of the most effective forms of oppression of Indigenous peoples in Canada has been through educational institutions, particularly the residential school system. And here in our school, we have the honor of working alongside eight residential school survivors, one of whom is sitting next to me now. We recognize that since this is an international conference, there may be participants who are not familiar with the residential school system here in Canada. So Elder Tina is going to share some history as well as her own experience. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, I'm a bitch. Uh, the residential school system was um, absolutely integral to the uh, oppression and control of indigenous peoples in Canada. It began in the 1800s and attendance became mandatory in 1990. Children in 1920, sorry. <laughs> so children, some as young as three, were forcibly removed from their families and later attend institutions where they were subjected to all kinds of abuses, as well as government experimentation, poor sanitation, disease, and death. Many families were never form informed of their children's death and were not allowed the dignity of uh, receiving the body for traditional burial. Residential schools did not exist to educate the child. They were a way to assimilate while killing the Indian child as um, enacted by the then Prime Minister, uh, John A. MacDonald. He decided that the best way to kill the Indian in the Indian child was to remove the kids from their families. The goal was to mold the child to fit by whatever means necessary into the white man's system. For over a century, residential school survivors and their families have been coping with the abuses that they experience at these facilities. The effects of this system has spread far and wide and have carried through the generations. With the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, we released its 94 calls to action in 2015. It began to seem like there might be some progress made toward healing, but much of the information has gone, gone unheard. It was only in May of this year with the discovery of the 215 unmarked graves uh, on the site of a former residential school in Cambridge, BC, that uh, light was shone on what the First Nations had been saying all along. Many Canadians began to understand the truth of what residential school survivors have been saying all along. This painting by Kent Hoffman, orig originally created in 2017, has come to symbolize outrage and grief after the discovery of the Mark Graves, which shows children being taken, torn from their mother's arms. Entitled The Scream, it depicts priests nuns and members of the RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, tearing children from their mother's arms to take them to the residential school. On my first day of residential school, uh, uh, my parents, my parents got the letter that I was to be enrolled in the residential school that fall. And uh, 
So uh, my my parents got me ready to go. Uh, residential schools have been called a dark chapter in Canada's history. Yeah. You're telling your story now. Yeah. Oh, okay. This is your oh yeah. Time. Okay. My once my parents got that letter, my mother uh, made uh, uh, she tanned a hide, and she made me these little brand new little moccasins, smoke tanned hide moccasins. Uh, made me a little dress, bought me a little jacket. I was really quite excited to go be going to that school, and so uh, those were the days when there were no cars or electricity in this community. So my parents drove me in a horse-drawn wagon to the residential school that you see on the screen here. And we went in through this door where you see this man standing. That was the entrance to the office. And uh, we went in there and there are two other little girls there who uh, were also being registered. And then once we're registered, our parents went home and uh, this woman large woman in our eyes came and said something but we didn't speak a word of English we didn't know what she was saying then she said it louder but we still didn't know but now my excitement about school was starting to turn to fear and then she put she took us down to the basement as you see over there and uh, took us to this place we didn't know what the showers meant showers were, but that's what it was. Uh, <clears throat> and she said something to us again, but we didn't know, so she just grabbed us and stripped our clothes off. And now, by now, we're shaking and we're crying. And then she doused our, our hair and our body with kerosene oil and started to run the water. And uh, the first shower we ever had, we thought we were going to be drowned. We were crying by then, and she was yelling at us. But, and then afterwards, she issued us these clothes, I guess uh, school uniforms. And I never saw my uh, my brand new moccasin and dress again. My mother died that following June, January, and uh, those moccasin and her dress were the last things she did for me. And I never got to and I, I still think about those times. But this is this is the story of every First Nation child who entered residential school. Our braids were cut into uh, short bowl cuts. And um, of course, uh, issued new coats. And um, then let's begin this journey of uh, abuse, assimilation, whatever. And, uh, and this is why today we see a lot of addictions in the community because all of these um, are what we're trying to hide, I guess, from. And, uh, but with the truth and reconciliation, we hope that we find a path to healing so we can live our lives and move forward. Yeah, uh, the residential schools have been called a, bad, a dark chapter in Canada's history. But with the last residential school not closing its door until 1996, History lives today in the survivors. Many of our students are cared for by their grandparents uh, because the parents were unable to look after them because of addictions or whatever. And uh, most of the grandparents are survivors of residential school. So with this in mind um, about grandparents, what might it bring up? for a grandparent if your grandchild comes home saying that their teacher is mean? So this is a question that we would love to uh, be able
able to have a short discussion around. I'm going to stop sharing for just a minute here. And checking in, you're able to hear us and, oh, I see you have a chat. Oh, beautiful school. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so the question is, what might it bring up for a grandparent if their grandchild comes home and says that their teacher is mean? I, I imagine that school can often bring up a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder for people who've gone through the residential school system. So a lot of kind of reliving the trauma of their own experiences if a child or grandchild comes home and says something like that. Yeah, and especially, do you want to explain where the school was? Oh yes, the residential school that you can see on the picture was located just across from where um, our school is, Nakoda Elementary, the, the present high school is uh, built on top of that land for the residential school, just across from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when grandparents come, they are directly across the street from where they might have attended residential school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. What, I mean, Amy, is there other? Well, no, it's just um, on Black History, so University of Calgary, which you are not far from us, and you know the story happening in Canada right now, it's, it's really hard for us to get, uh, to bridge the gap between education and the community because of the history and the intergenerational trauma that residential schools presented to our people. So you can only imagine what a grandparent or a parent thinks when a child comes home and says their teacher is mean because they're gonna right away think about that school next door and what happened to them. And right now that's that's what we're doing now it is we're, we're re we're re we're making it we're re-imaging what education is in the community. So you know, having these conversations, these hard conversations for First Nations and you know non-native individuals to understand and and to be aware, because it's it's worse when we're just sweeping it under the rug as First Nations people as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can imagine. Oh, sorry, Harrison, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. Um, I was just going to add, I, I can't imagine the Alberta government is helping at all right now either. Like my one of my questions was like, how do you go through all of this when the government itself, the provincially is so, they're just stonewalling this, this type of work and they're being so inappropriate about it. They won't even recognize um, the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation as a, as a thing in Alberta. And so... No, I, as a fellow Albertan, I'm just, I'm mortified at Alberta in general right now, but especially in this area, so. Yeah, we're hoping that, um, you know, as, as days come that people stand with us. Um, we've always, you know, we've always had that relationship with the provincial government. We deal more federally, which is, could be another reason why. So, you know, as days, as days go on, we're really hoping that this isn't continued to be swept under the rug, but it's going to take all of us to acknowledge and to heal together, for sure. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking on like a, you know, very, uh, like on a micro level, in terms of this question too, is, well, if a child goes home and tells their grandparent that a teacher was mean, does the grandparent send them to school anymore? Does the grandparent come and address it with the teacher or with admin, right? Like it, the history and the experiences that people have gone through has made it so that education is not to be trusted. And so it's better to take the child out than to engage with it and see if like the problem might be fixed. And this is clearly like not everyone, you know, it's not, it's a very big generalization, but it is something that we have seen. And so part of the hope is that, well, can we build relationship that is more trusting and, um, and more genuine so that community members feel that this actually is a place for them and this is a place for their kids as well. Mm -hmm. I do uh, liaison work with uh, kids that are coming to school and that's one of the First things the parents say is, the teacher was mean. 
And the people of my age, when a teacher is mean means uh, being hit with a ruler or book or whatever. And this is what uh, the grandparents fear. So I have to explain to them that doesn't happen anymore. And uh, teachers and staff are not allowed to strike a child in any way, shape, or form. Um, but some still go some places. Mm -hmm. And it's still a living, breathing fear in mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the 21st century. Hi, I have one question. Uh, my name is Cynthia. I am from Brazil. Um, I live in Winnipeg. Uh, before I moved to Canada, I'm not so aware about the history of uh, colonization, the indigenous issues uh, here in Canada. Now, I, I, I am a PhD student in the, the Faculty of Education, and I'm working in, in an NGO. I am a community support to work. And most of our participants are indigenous, but also they some have some problems with the criminal justice, uh, mental illness, or a lot of social problems. And I, I just, I, I don't know if it's a question, but when you formulate your question, I'm just thinking how the lack of the trust in the educational system, it still affect the, the educational trajectory of indigenous people here in Canada, because most of my, my, my participants um, drop off of the schools, um, don't, didn't have the opportunity to go to the university or, or even have a better life. They still um, face so many social problems. And some of problems I think could be challenged by more strong education, more opp educational opportunities. Do you know what I mean? How this lack of the trust affect the educational trajectory of indigenous people here? She wants to know how this has affected the educational trajectory of indigenous people. Like how has it affected education overall and people like not attending school or dropping out of school and things like that? Yes? Okay, yes. So like one of the things that I can touch on is when we're talking about intergenerational trauma, we're talking about things that happened to our grandparents and our great grandparents in residential schools. They were stripped from their family. They were stripped from their culture, their language and their way of life. So once these schools shut down and the kids returned back to the community, they didn't have any identity. They didn't know who they were. So now we're trying to figure out, well, who am I? Where do I belong? And not, not getting the love, the care, or the attention. So a lot of our grandparents raised, were raised and up, you know, they were brought up without the love and the care of a parent. And it carried on through generation through generation. So that's when addictions, substance abuse, lack of education all happened because of how, how much the government failed us as a people. Mm -hmm. So then those traumas carried on from generation to generation. And I'm sure Tyna can, can touch on that, on her experience or even of people that she knows and how it affected the parenting of the child. So that's where it all lays is they were stripped from everything. And one day they became parents and we didn't know how to parent. We didn't know the importance of education. We didn't know how to say, I love you, how to hug because we were never given that in residential schools. And that still lives today mm -hmm. that nobody, you know, that it's still, it's getting out there, but a lot of people, you know, they just don't know. And, and we need to ask these questions. And that was a great question because it's it's out there and it's alive. Can I ask a follow-up? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, can I ask a follow-up of the two of you, which is that I'm sitting next to two people and we have a third person in the room who's also educated. But my two co-presenters are both highly educated individuals. And you have tying up you have encouraged your children to pursue that as well. And so where do you think that fits into this conversation? Okay. Um, when I left residential school, 
all children to leave residential school at the age of 16. When you legally leave school, um, you come out of there with no self-esteem whatsoever. Your whole 10, 11 years at residential school, you've been told, called a stupid Indian, you will never amount to anything, you little heathen, whatever. So you walk out of there with no self-esteem at all, angry, bitter, and uh, but when I left school, um, I had a teacher in grade eight who was instrumental in busing us out to the local provincial school to do uh, high school because it wasn't available in the residential school. But it was him that instilled the belief in me. At, as I've always said, at one, a teacher can make a big difference in a child's life. This teacher did it for me that I was capable of achieving more. And then he was instrumental in getting me and uh, getting me into what was called the Calgary School for Nursing Aids in Calgary. And uh, it was a one year course, uh, which uh, made you a certified nursing aide, which is called nursing assistance to other babies. But that provided me an avenue, I guess, uh, a path out of poverty. I was able to work all through 11 hospitals and be able to provide for myself. So when I came back, I married and I had my children, I stressed education to them because it had provided me with a better, better uh, standard of living. Uh, we were very poor back in those days in those communities. And so uh, I've always stressed education to my kids. I have a daughter who has, who's a PhD. I have my youngest son is a PhD candidate with the University of Calgary. And all of my children got their degrees. I had a teacher, my late daughter, Kimberly, was the first one in our family to get a degree. And she, she got her BL. And she taught here at the Mori Community School for 18 years. But that has provided us, my whole family, with a better standard of living. And that's what we're trying to tell the community people, our relatives. Mm -hmm. and to be that voice of change, that yeah. they are worth it and they are capable of doing things. So I, with the people that you're working with, I can see, you know, the, the struggles is because they didn't have that person to tell them their worth. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're trying, we're trying to, to, you know, build our, our youth up to know their worth. And, yeah. that, and that's why education is so crucial in First Nations communities. So, you know, we, we <clears throat> fill those gaps when they do, when they're inner city or when they travel, when they get out, you know, explore the world. Thank you so much for those questions. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. So I'm gonna get back to sharing the presentation, but uh, we will be done with plenty of um, time. Ooh, I'm on the wrong thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, so we are going to move to um, Amy sharing her story. Um, of her first, or I guess, story of her first days of school. Yeah, yes. I'm just going to move this a little closer yeah. to you, but I don't want to mess up the sure. show. So the, the image that I picked was actually, this was one of my grandmother's first days of school. So um, a little different story than Tyna, which was typical when they went to school, they were stripped and dressed and all. What my grandparent, my great grandparents did was <clears throat> they cut their hair themselves. And my great grandmother made their clothes so they wouldn't be stripped and bathed. Um, so it was a very powerful picture to me because this was the first time my grandparent, my grandmother, started walking in two worlds. Um, growing up, that's what we're taught. We're taught that we have to learn how to walk in two worlds. And I was fortunate enough, many, you know, many of my people weren't, to understand the importance of, you know, 
keeping true and understanding your culture, your traditions, your language, and your values, but also learning the importance of education and living in a white man's world. And that's what my grandmother was taught. And a lot of, you know, grandparents and great grandparents, we lost them in residential schools because they, we, we didn't know. And um, onto the next slide is where we do, where I kind of laid out my educational journey on how I got to where I am today. Um, <clears throat> as we're all in Canada right now, so everybody in the presentation, I went to elementary school off reserve. Uh, right from kindergarten to high school, I was in a provincial school only 30 minutes down the road. Um, I was one of the very few First Nations people throughout my whole education journey. Uh, there was a handful of us who attended school off reserve then. And, you know, there was no talk about our people. And we were only 30 minutes down the road. We never, we never got to learn about other First Nations communities. And it's changing now. Education is changing now. And it's part of the curriculum. But it was hard. Because, you know, I didn't graduate too long ago. And they were still trying to assimilate us. And um, after I, I got through high school and I attended university, I actually moved to Montana in the United States and I attended um, a Native American university. So where then we became the majority and there were very few white people there. And we learned about you know intergenerational trauma, why it's so important when we're working in First Nations communities and why we need to build relationships just because of the failures of the government in so many ways, not just in education. And then after I finished my degree, I moved back home to here, here in Minnickney. I, I was a teacher for five years before I um, became, you know, uh, made my transition into the administration role. And even when I moved back home, I was one, I think there was only three First Nation te certified teachers in the building. So it was still very concerning to me because although I moved home, we were in my community, it was still very colonized. The curriculum was to fit, you know, the, the, the child was to fit the curriculum. It was, you know, standardized testing and all of the stuff that never worked for us. And I'm guessing for other, you know, indigenous communities around the world is we were still so adamant on teaching X, Y, and Z to things that just weren't relevant to our people. And it was hard for me as a teacher because I knew right away that my students, they couldn't, they couldn't connect with a lot of the curriculum because they were confined to living on the reservation their whole life. And that's not what Alberta education sees, right? They see the one child, that exceptional child who's gonna get through school, learning all of these things that they tell us to learn. So after I taught for a little while, um, in 2019 is when I became vice principal here at the elementary school. And that's when I even saw the bigger problem. I, I didn't understand. I had so many questions and concerns of why are we doing these things in a First Nations school when we can clearly see they're not working for our people. I didn't understand why we were still doing standardized testing. I don't like standardized testing. And it's just because it's not for the minority. And we were still doing it here. And I didn't understand why sometimes our PD days, they weren't applicable to our, to our community and to our people, maybe for our teachers whose children attend provincial schools and they do all these things provincially, but they weren't for our kids. And when I first got into administration, I knew it was hard for some of my colleagues in admin to hear me out because they've been doing it for so long. And I think I was kind of stirring the pot. Uh, my first year as vice principal, after I had all these questions and concerns, I was even told that I just need to like sit back. I need to observe for my first year. I need to get the hang of being in admin. And they, I didn't have real answers as to why we were doing everything. Um, so with, with that, I, I came back 
I observed, I of course had my concerns and I addressed them as always. <laughs> And then um, just the summer of this year, I became principal here. And it's been um, an amazing journey, uh, to say the least. And I knew right away that things needed to change, and I had the power to change them now. Um, so with that being said, right away, um, we started implementing things here to fit our children. And that's just the thing with education is as a teacher, you know, as a counselor, as an administrator, as a social worker, whatever you're doing, you need to make sure that your work fits your students, your clients, or the people you're helping. And I think we just get that mixed up because we continue to do things that help for us, but didn't aren't gonna help the people you're helping. And that's what I'm making sure that the staff know here in our school is we're here for our IFCA children and nobody else. And then um, we're sitting here. So Tyna and Abigail, they were, our offices are so close together and we're always in each other's offices. And every time I have, you know, this big idea, of course I'm coming to Tyna and I'm like, this is what I see. How do you see it? Making sure I get her blessings, of course, because uh, what Taina has to say and, and you know, above all is her word. So one of our biggest things here is our vision now moving forward is uh, moving towards a model that fits our community and not a model that fits the government's image. So one of the big things here is, is relationship-based. Um, and it being culturally relevant. And our biggest goal is academically rigorous. Like as we said, academics and education has never been easy here. And I don't want it to be that way anymore. I, I, want, I want a waiting list and I want kids to take, or parents to take their children out of provincial schools and bring them back to the community because we're far more of what we were than the school next door. Um, when I talk about establishing relationships with the community, it means that trust needs to be implemented. If we don't have the trust, we can't expect to, to make any movement here. The biggest voice is a parent voice, and I'm really trying to get that out there, that as soon as parents are vocal about things, is they're gonna be heard. When I talk about culturally relevant, is we don't want our children to lose our culture or their identity. So we're making sure that we make the curriculum fit our children and not the other way around by them understanding where they are, who they are, and you know where they come from. And then when we say academically rigor, uh, rigorous, it's accomplishing walking in two worlds, as I was taught. It's knowing, again, who they are and how they're going to change the world. Again, being that motivation and being that support for them if they don't get it at home. And then on to the next one, one of our, one of, one of the things that we're doing to implement to make sure that our children are successful is we're molding the staff. And we're starting with the staff because it's coming from the top down. Um, when, when we talk about molding the staff, these are three things that we're trying to do. So we're doing, you know, we're bringing the Ithka language back. It is mandatory for our, our non-nation speakers to take classes every Friday here at the school and to learn our language. And even just, you know, the basics, greetings, counting, stuff that, you know, we're giving them tools to connect with their families and then incorporating more of the language um, into everyday classroom and activities. And I know Tyna can elaborate um, on the word IFCA. Yeah. Our language, um, the IFCA language, uh, the name for ourselves is IFCA. We are related to the, uh, the Sioux people. Uh, the Sioux language has three dialects, Dakota, Lakota, and Lakota. And our language is part of the Lakota dialect. And we say IFCA, which means speakers of the clear language. And that's, that's our name for ourselves and for our language. Yeah. So. 
And that, and that's one thing that we're bringing back. And for our educators to understand the importance of keeping our language, because as many people know, is a lot of First Nations communities have lost that due, you know, residential schools and intergenerational trauma. Another big thing is we're improving PD. You know, we're addressing uncomfortable talk topics such as privilege, power, um, and colonialism. And that, that's where Abigail comes in. She's been an amazing part of our team where these difficult conversations are not difficult for her. Mm. And she knows the importance of non-nation members understanding our way. And, and we're very grateful to have, to have Abigail here. Um, our educational assistants, they're all Stony Nation members, Minikini Nation members. And it's very important that they have a voice. They never really did before, which was baffling to me also. So making sure we're connecting with them. What do they see? What do they see that can change in the classroom? And engaging in meaningful team building. We've never really had team building here. And it, and it, it was much needed. And we're, we're now on that path. And then, of course, the big one, indigenizing curriculum. And when we talk about indigenizing curriculum, that's when we're, we're examining where indigenous knowledge can be honored through the curriculum, recognizing the site, how everything can tie into it. And we don't need to, we don't need to fit it, it can fit us. And expanding the definition of teacher to include our knowledge keepers, our community members into the school because they're our greatest teachers in First Nations communities. So when we talk about molding the school and bringing in, you know, our knowledge keepers, that's, that's, these are the steps that we're taking. Um, in order, in order to get to where we want to be with the school and the community and bridging those gaps is inviting elders and community knowledge keepers into the classroom. And, and recognizing that their stories and their, their expertise in certain things are valued so much in education. And bringing the classroom outside, we're, we're doing a lot more land-based learning here. Um, we're trying to establish and sustain a land-based classroom, not the traditional provincial school land-based classroom, but an indigenous land-based classroom where we're learning all about our people, history, um, traditional teachings, and then celebrating culture. So one of the big things about celebrating culture is, um, Abigail can touch on this because we've done, we've done some pretty amazing things here right in the school and it being the community gathering. Oh, sure. Um, so this one that I've written here about the Regalia Project is something that um, Grandma Tina and I started a few years ago, where we received funding to um, allow community members to teach families, uh, parents, how to um, build powwow dancing outfits. Um, so these outfits can be very, very expensive. And so a lot of students who like to dance, their families can't afford to um, create the outfits. And so what we've done is created a program where the parents are able to learn marketable skills uh, in terms of sewing and beading. Oh no, we don't do beading, sewing. No. <laughs> um, and uh, so that they're able to make repairs to the outfits if they need to, or create another one, or maybe it becomes a passion and they want to sell them themselves. Uh, and so it enables students to dance. And then we have a school powwow here at the end of that, where the children are initiated into uh, the dancing community as well. Uh, just keeping an eye on time, we only have a few minutes left. 